Ruth 4, 1 through 12. Now I'll be reading from the New English Translation. Now Boaz went up to the village gate and sat there. Then along came the guardian whom Boaz had mentioned to Ruth. Boaz said, Come here, what's your name? And sit down. So he came and sat down. <coughs> Boaz chose ten of the village leaders and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then Boaz said to the guardian, Naomi, who has returned from the region of Moab, is selling a portion of land that belongs to her, our relative Elimelech. So I am illegally informing you, acquire it before those sitting here and before the leaders of my people. If you want to exercise your right to redeem it, then do so. If not, then tell me so, I will know. For you possess the first option to redeem it. I am next in line after you. He replied, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, When you acquire the field from Naomi, you must also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the wife of our deceased relative, in order to preserve his family name for rising up a descendant who will inherit his property. Then the guardian said, Then I am, not unable, then I am unable to redeem it, for I would ruin my own inheritance in that case. You may exercise my redemption option, for I am unable to redeem it. Now this was used to be the customary way to finalize a transaction involving redemption in Israel. Man would remove his sandal and give it to the other party. This was a legally binding act in Israel. So the guardian said to Boaz, you may acquire it, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz said to the leaders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have acquired from Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech, Kylan, and Malan. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malan, as my wife, to raise up a descendant who will inherit his property, so the name of the deceased might not disappear from among her relatives and from his village. You are witnesses today. All the people who were at the gate and the elders replied, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the women, the woman who is entering your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom build up the house of Israel. May you prosper in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. May your family become like the family of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Through the descendants the Lord gives you by this young woman. Today's sermon, Safe in the Arms. We have chapter 4, finally getting down to the nuts and bolts of the book of Ruth. We've gone through a lot of stuff in this love story, which does not have God as being an active rule. God doesn't talk here. God doesn't tell someone to do something. None of that happens in this book. And there's some commentaries that open up when they talk about Ruth, say they don't understand why it's in the book, in the Bible. But I believe as we read Ruth and study it, we can see how God is working in the background. And how God keeps his hand on people and in their lives, though they may not find it out. I know for myself, I get caught up in my daily routine and kind of forget that God is always with me. Day in, day out, 24-7, every minute of every hour. And then something comes along and happens. And as I look back over the event, I can see why it is 
that I made it through. And there's only really one ex reason to explain why I didn't run over that car that pulled out in front of him and slammed on his brakes as I'm driving down the road. Chapter 3 ended with Ruth waiting for word from Boaz on her proposal to marry her. And she was sitting there waiting. Remember Naomi said, stay put and wait and see how this turns out. Will we say yes or will we say no? Which one will become her redeemer? I didn't wonder if Boaz may have been just a bit anxious about the situation. We can, as we read Ruth, the first three chapters, I think we can see, really see that Boaz fell in love with Ruth. He had a thing for her, as in modern words would say. And she had a thing for him. I don't know that they got down to passing back and forth notes as it, like we used to do in high school. When we loved somebody, we thought we loved somebody, we'd pass notes. I know I got sent some, and a little triangle football thing, you know, fold in a triangle paper. And of course, I'd respond back and fold it up. I had to learn how to fold it that way, though. But it's what we did. I don't know that Ruth and Boaz did that. Probably not. But I'm sure they had a communication somehow about their feelings for each other. So this is where I wonder if Boaz, as he walked to the city gates that morning, was he a little anxious about how this would turn out? And as he was walking along, do you think the wheels were spinning in his mind? How can I bring this across to my advantage? I've got to tell this other guy, he's a closer relative than I am, and he has first chance. How am I going to present Ruth in such a way that he doesn't want her that I end up with her? I'm not sure, I'm not so sure if the land really was that important. He was thinking, I need to come up with a plan to convince this dude. He doesn't want to exercise his duty to redeem Naomi and Ruth. And their land. Somehow, I must make it look like Ruth really isn't worthy having without giving her a bad reputation or make her look bad. I've got to make it look like Ruth really isn't the kind of woman you want. She isn't the kind of woman that fit your lifestyle. <clears throat> Maybe I can use the angle that she is a Moabite woman. If you look back at our ancestries and years back, you can see what they did to our men years ago. How the Moabite women enticed our men and made us walk away from God. Boaz gets to the gate, gathers ten elders, Different translations have leaders or judges. But he gathers these people. They, these were the leaders of the, of the town, of the, of the city. And this is where business was done, at the city gates. They would sit there and come with their problems, your business matters, whatever that needed witnessing, and you did your business with them. It's kind of like going to the town hall, the courthouse nowadays. He gathers them together and has them sit down. Then he sits and waits. Because he knows this other dude's going to be coming along before long. And he sees him coming along. 
He says, hey, dude. Hey, what's your face? Come over here and sit down. You notice King James says, such a one. The new King James says, hey, friend. The New English translation says, what's your name? Why wasn't this fellow mentioned? He obviously knew him. He was a relative. It doesn't tell us. The idea is maybe. The reason he isn't mentioned is because he wasn't worthy of being mentioned. He was going to say no to being a redeemer. If you look at where this law comes from, the law of redeeming the land so it would stay in the clan or the tribe, if a man refused to marry the woman to bring on offspring or an, uh, to give inheritance, if he said no, the woman had the right to take his shoe and spit in his face. It was a disgrace if he said no. <clears throat> Is this why the Bible doesn't mention it? Don't know. Speculation. That's all the longer I dwell on that. Because it's not there, so it's not really important. It doesn't have anything to do really with the outcome of the book of Ruth. He says, I've got a proposal for you. You know that woman, Naomi? Well, she's selling her land that belonged to her husband. And you're next to kin. So it's your duty to redeem it. If you don't want to redeem it, tell me so that I can do it myself. Because I'm next in line, so then I will do it. If you remember the law, it would be that Naomi would need to be married to this guy, so there would be someone to pass on the name of Elimelech. But there's a little kink in this. They had a son. So when Elimelech dies, then everything would go to Malon. But he also dies. But what Boaz is saying is you have to buy Naomi's land and take her. Which there's no problem there because she's too old to have children anymore. So we wouldn't have to have a child with her so they can pass on the inheritance. But being that Ruth was likely was getting up in years, I wrote that wrong. That's Naomi. Just get up here. Said, this wasn't going to happen. So what's her name says, well, this is great and wonderful. That's probably a good field. I can do that. I'll buy it. I'll be the redeemer. I will exercise my right, and I will take it. But then Boaz goes, he pulls a fast one from what's his name. He said, well, there's just one little detail I didn't tell you. I didn't get, to, get to, to it yet. You need to be aware of this. You know that woman that came with Naomi? That Moabite woman? Ruth? Well, she was married to Emelik's son. And he died too. Well, Ruth comes with the property. She's actually the one that must be married to redeem the land so it can be passed on in the family. It will be up to you, up to, you to provide a son to save the family's name. Seems kind of a little underhanded and tricky. You think maybe? It's kind of like if you go to buy 
buy a used car that's been sitting for a while, and the seller says, it's for sale. I'll sell it to you as is. You look the car over, and you ask him about the motor works. Yeah, the transmission works. Yeah, the brakes are all good. Well, they're about half. That's okay. It has decent tires. So you say, okay, here's the money. And the seller says, <laughs> no, it's, it wasn't Deb's car. <laughs> <laughs> so the seller says, oh, wait a minute. There's one little detail I need to tell you, right? just as you hand in the money. Transmission stuck in second gear. But other than that, it's a great car. This is kind of what Boaz did. It's almost that this Boaz planned it this way. To keep a small detail back to shock what's-his-face <clears throat> into saying, no, I don't want it. And Boaz had it worked out that he had witnesses there to hear this said. It made him hesitate. Boaz made it known that Ruth was a Moab. And I'm pretty sure that Boaz mentioned what kind of people the Moabites were. Maybe he said they worshipped other gods. He sacrificed the kids to their gods. Maybe even mentioned that the fact that they could not enter God's house of worship. But whatever it was, it worked. Because he said then, you can have the man. <coughs> What's his face said? You can have the man. And the woman. Because it would not be good for me and my bunch. So what's the face takes off the shoe, gives it to Boaz. Boaz then turns to the judges sitting at the gates and see, says, You've witnessed this. Everyone here is witness the deal. I will take Ruth as my wife and raise up a son to inherit the land so the family name will not disappear. See, Ruth and Naomi were in dire straits. There's no way they could continue on the names of their husbands on their own. These two were destined to the poorhouse forever. If there wasn't an intervention in some way, there needed to be someone to come along and give them a helping hand. Did you notice he mentions ten elders of the city? Someone grinned a little bit like he thinks they know where I'm going. How many commandments are there? There's ten commandments. The elders were the leaders or the judges of the city. They were the ones who enforced the law. They told what happened. The first guy, the one who was not named, is the one who legally, according to the law, is to redeem Ruth. But he claims he is unable to redeem according to the law. Question is, what does the law do? What does the law reveal? The redemption law was put in place when the Israelites came into the promised land. It was divided up to each tribe and each clan or family got a share. 
The law was designed to keep this land <coughs> in each family forever. The law reveals who is to redeem the land for each family, but it could not make it happen. This law was given. This is how it's supposed to be. It revealed the process. But it could not make it happen. Someone had to make a decision, a personal choice, to make it happen. To be open to making it happen. The Ten Commandments. They unreveal what the sin, what the sins are. They tell us if you do these things, then it's going to be a bad thing. And it being a bad thing, it is displeasing to God. The law cannot bring salvation. You can live a life that follows the law, follow, follows the law to the T, but it will not be good enough to bring you into the presence of God. The law only reveals our sin, where we are wrong, where what displeases God. There were men in the New Testament they lived a life according to the law. They were very strict in this. And they expected others to do the same. But what was it that Jesus called them? Serpents. Brutal vipers. How can you escape the commandment, the condemnation of hell? It's in Matthew 23. John the Baptist, in Matthew 3, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, what did he say? Brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath of, to come? Just as in the time of Ruth and Naomi, in their culture, there was nothing they could do to save themselves from ruination. Just as then, we today cannot save ourselves from damnation on our own. There must be someone to step in and save the day. Just as in the case of Ruth, there was no one who loved her enough to come forward to do what needed to be done to save her. We today have someone who loves us enough to do what is needed to save us. Jesus Christ was born of a woman. Jesus became flesh. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was fully God. The Word was with God in the beginning. All things were created by Him, and apart from Him, not one thing that was created, not one thing was created that was, that has been created. I'll get it right. All things were created by Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Then later on in John 1, he says, Now the Word became flesh and took up residence among us. We saw His glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth, who came from the Father. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. Moses gave us the physical law, the Ten Commandments. There's a whole bunch of other laws in the, New in the Old Testament. But everybody likes to cling to the Ten Commandments. We live by these, we'll be okay. 
If he physically followed these laws, it's not going to get you to heaven. Jesus Christ brought the spiritual that we need, the spirituality, the grace, and the truth. We must learn to worship Jesus in the spirit. That's what God wants, is our hearts, is the spirit. Because God loves the world, he sent his one and only son so that whoever would believe in him would not face eternal death, but have eternal life. Jesus tells us he is the only way to glory and the presence of God. We can follow the letter of the law. We can do every ceremony in the book. And we will still fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing that we have or can do that is good enough for God. We must allow Jesus into our lives and let him take over to guide and lead us into that road that leads to heaven. There's nothing that we have. There's nothing that we can do that will get us to God. I knew this. I want to leave you with a picture of what it takes to get to God. We cannot get there on our own. We must have Jesus Christ. I knew this. I forgot, it, but I was reminded. I had a talk with a gentleman the other day, a young gentleman. He had a rough life. He came to Christ. He's all bubbly about Jesus. He was in a rehab center. He had to go to church. They weren't supposed to go to Sunday school, but go to church. And then back to rehab center. That's where they spent their time. Then went to church and back. The person that was supposed to take him screwed up and took him to Sunday school. As they were sitting there, the teacher told him this. I want you to close your eyes <coughs> as I say this. I want you to picture. I want you to picture yourself standing on a cliff. As you stand there on a the cliff looking down, you see hell and the flames of hell. Satan and demons down in that bottomless pit. As you look back up, over on the other side of another cliff that is way too far to jump is God standing. The heavenly angels. How are you to get across to God? As you stand there looking, you see Jesus rising up with his arms outstretched on the cross. And they reach across from one cliff to the other. That is the connection that you walk across to the Heavenly Father. There's nothing that we can do to get to God. It must be through Jesus Christ. And that was the moment that young gentleman gave his life to Christ. He says, is that it? Is that the way? That's why Jesus Christ came. That is the Redeemer to us today. Just as Boaz is Redeemer to Ruth.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the, the words in Ruth. Thank you for the Bible, for your words as they lead and guide us, comfort us, discipline us. May we be open to the Holy Spirit speaking in our hearts to do the will of God. That when that glorious day comes and Jesus returns and calls us up to you, may we be in that glorious resurrection morning when that last trump sounds. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for those that do not know Jesus. May the Holy Spirit continually knock on the doors, the heart's door. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.